extinction risk from AI uh, is should be as you know mitigating that should be as great an import a priority as mitigating the risks from nuclear weapons and pandemics. And I entirely agree with that. But that's to only focus on the extinction risk is to miss um, what I think the larger picture is, which is that the move from present society to a society that where AI systems are as or even much more powerful than um, humans is an inflection point and potentially could have an impact over the very, very long run, whether or not the human race goes extinct. I mean, AI could have huge benefits yeah. if we deal with the technology responsibly, if we are cautious, go slow, and invest in AI safety techniques. <laughs>
So yeah. we've, we tend not to see what we have actually achieved. Yeah, well, news like, media has systematically gone more negative. Over exactly. The last but of decades. journalists are also human beings, people, yeah, ordinary yeah, people. So, I mean, it's, I think it's within all of us. But yeah, yeah, I think so. I Some agree. psychological state we have to focus on the negative. Perhaps it's evolutionary. Could something be. Like that. Yeah. Could be. Anyway, so let's go into the basics here. So what is long-termism? How, how distant the future are we talking about here? Yeah, so long-termism is the idea that we should be doing much more than we currently are for, to protect the interests of future generations. So we should be making, positively influencing the long-term future a key priority of our time. And ultimately, I think that uh, we should care about future generations whenever they are in time. So I think if we're doing things that are harming uh, future generations, it doesn't matter if that harm comes in 10 years or 50 years or 200 years or 1,000 years or even longer. We should care about that all the same. And so we should be paying particular attention to issues that um, will have very long-lasting impacts. Yeah. So how, how many years are we talking about? Is it thousands of years or hundreds of thousands I think of it, years? Uh, it could be longer. So the human... Um, species has been around for 300,000 years so far. As far as we know, yeah. Um, as far as we know. I mean, other human species have been around for millions of years. Yeah. Um, but Homo sapiens was 300,000 approximately. Uh, typical mammal species lasts about a million years. Um, but, you know, humans aren't a typical mammal species. We have technology and so on that means that, in principle at least, there's no reason why civilization couldn't last much longer, mm. where the Earth will remain habitable for hundreds of millions of years and perhaps civilization one day takes to the stars, um, then the future could be billions of years long. I love that perspective. That's a huge perspective. I think it's, it's I mean, brilliant, it's, it is, you know, it's quite humbling. Like from the, it is, yes. You know, you might think, oh, we're in the middle of history, but given the grand sweep of history, we are the ancients. We're the, the very beginning of time. We're the, yeah. We live in the distant past compared to almost everything that will ever happen. You could also see it philosophically in another way, actually, that, that, that the now moment is that the only time that, that exists, that the I mean, future is an illusion and the past is an illusion. If you see what uh, I mean. Yeah, I mean, we that, don't have to go into that. but that, that could well be true, but nonetheless, the future will be a reality, and we can do things now that can make that reality better or worse. Very true. So tell us about, I mean, you're, you're an optimist, I'm an optimist, basically, but, uh, but what makes people tick, for the most part, are um, catastrophes and, and risks and threats. So... To go into that, tell us about the potential threats to humankind that you write about in the book. Uh, you, you have four, I think, four main um, mm -hmm. headlines there. Lock-in, extinction, collapse, and stagnation. Mm -hmm. And before, before I let you answer that, I, this is a broad question, but I think yeah. you, can, you, can, you can take it because you know, you know what you've written about yourself here. And on, on the extinction part there, can you rate threats like pandemics, bioweapons, nuclear war, climate change, and astronomical and geological events mm -hmm. in order of magnitude? So, uh, two, think, twofold question. Okay, yeah. I mean, on terms of rating those risks, uh, you know, it is possible. It's very hard. You have to make a judgment call. Um, but I do find that experts tend to agree on magnitudes of the risks, where um, newer risks that we have less under control um, tend to, newer technological risks tend to score higher. So, risks from pandemics, especially pandemics from man-made pathogens, so viruses made in a lab, they tend to be among the biggest risks. And risks from catastrophe from artificial intelligence, which has uh, really been in the news a lot since I um, wrote about it in this book a year ago. Um, a lot, happened. Have, a lot has time. happened since yeah. then. And uh, again, that's something that experts are extremely worried about. You know, I think it's more likely that you'll die in an AI-driven catastrophe than um, a car crash, like in your lifetime. And that's really worth thinking about. Uh, and then, but then there are these, you know, different categories of risks. So lock-in um, is the idea that, you know, the future might still last a long time, but be governed by bad values, um, whether that's because of uh, we've you know, lost kind of liberal egalitarian democratic values that we treasure today, and instead we have an authoritarian future, perhaps a stable global dictatorship, um, or just because we make moral mistakes in the future. If you imagine kind of you know, the Romans would have thought they were the pinnacle of civilization, yet they owned slaves, they owned slaves, they were extremely patriarchal. They, um, uh, you know, would torture prisoners for fun. Um, we don't want to have a future like that. We want to have a future where we continue to make moral progress. Uh, extinction is, uh, you know, literally everyone in the human, everyone, everyone dying. Um, again, um, 
I think it's more likely than one might think, uh, where you know the leading risk probably are from um, pandemics because um, we are creating the ability to make extremely powerful viruses in a lab, like far more powerful than um, one could find in nature. And that's just very worrying indeed, mm. um, unless we get, get uh, these risks under control. Um, and then uh, collapse, well, nuclear war, <laughs> yeah. uh, perhaps extreme climate change, um, uh, and other sorts of catastrophes could still lead to the collapse of civilization from which we never come back. Mm. And then finally is... Um, uh, yeah, this risk of stagnation, which might perhaps kind of multiplies the others. Because at the moment, we're living through a very risky time. And unless we get out of this risky period, then um, we're doomed eventually. So how, how to avert these risks? I mean, not, not to, to go into detail here, because I mean, not one man cannot do that. It's, it wouldn't be very wise, I think, to, be, to, mm. to tell exactly how to do it. But, but how should we generally think and act to kind of avoid these these risks yeah so um i mean the first thing for you know people listening here first thing is just to learn more so i try and explain this all in what we are the future uh, my colleague toby ord has a great companion book called the precipice um which again talks about existential risks and uh but then when we're actually starting to take action i think for most individuals there's two ways you can have a really big impact. One is through your donations, and the second is through um, your career. Uh, and that's so where it ties in with the effective, effective altruism. altruism. In general, exactly. So this idea of long-termism might um, impact kind of where you focus your effective altruism. So donations, I think anyone can um, have a big impact um, through their donations. And uh, I have an organization giving what we can, which encourages people to give at least 10% of their income to the very most effective charities. Um, also has recommendations of places where you can donate. Uh, a second organization is 80,000 hours, named after the number of hours you typically work in the course of your life. Yeah. And uh, that provides it highly in-depth advice on people who want to use their career to have a big positive impact. Mm. So your career choice is actually surprisingly important. It's extremely, I mean, your choice of career is going to be the, one of the biggest decisions you ever make in your life. And uh, getting it right is of enormous moral importance. Yeah, fascinating. Um, I think you're right. Yeah, when you think about it, it makes sense. Now, you point in the book, you point to the to the importance of a- actively changing moral mm. values yeah. to achieve a better future for humankind. So, which of today's uh, widespread moral values would you would you say would need to change? Yeah. Um, so I think the biggest things are, you can think of it as expanding our sphere of moral concern, where um, at the moment, uh, people's values are often very parochial. So, you know, we care about our families and we care to some extent about people in the same nation as ourselves. But I think that we should care equally about everyone all around the world. Like everyone has an equal right to a good life. Uh, I also think we should care much more than we do about non-human animals. So at the moment, almost 100 billion animals, land animals, are killed every year for food. And the vast majority of them are factory farmed, kept in horrific suffering. Mm. Um, we, that should just not be acceptable. Um, and then more generally, I just think is concern for the, the disenfranchised and the hidden away. So um, prisoners, for example, I mean, it's a bigger issue in the United States, but there are literally millions of people who are imprisoned for months or years, taken away from their families. Um, for nonviolent drug offences, and that again is something they don't get a lot of sympathy because criminals are demonised. But uh, I think we will look back in the future, you know, if things go well, and regard that as an, an abomination too. Yeah, but I mean, these values are that you're talking about. And I agree. I mean, we should we should be yeah. better at thinking about everybody else and about animals and all that. But it, it used to be even worse, didn't it? I, mean, I, I agree. Yeah. So it has happened a lot and, and people tend to, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of young people and, and people in my own age who don't eat meat because mm-hmm. of that and, uh, and all kinds of, you know. Yeah. So I do think we've seen in many ways tremendous moral progress um, over the last couple of centuries. So mm. feminist movement, um, abolition, civil rights yeah, movements, yeah, just abolition. like yes. wonderful steps forward in terms of moral progress. On animals, I think we've seen regress, ultimately. Okay. So people now say they care more. But the amount of animal suffering that we inflict uh, because we don't is see it. far, because we don't see it exactly, it's hidden away, far greater than it ever was in the past. Hmm. 
And then even if the trend has overall been positive, there's no guarantee of that. Um, in the early 20th century, we saw um, fascist movements arising out of democracies. There really can be moral regress, and we shouldn't at all be complacent that, you know, we're all going to figure that out and things will be okay just as long as we don't avoid catastrophe. It requires work from thinkers, from advocates, from activists to mm -hmm. ensure that uh, we do move. So who is going to push set. for that and how is it going to, to happen? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's um, incumbent upon all of us where yeah. um, there are, you know, researchers, thinkers, people who can try and kind of push the moral status quo and give arguments for ideas that uh, might sound absurd at the time in the way that the abolition of slavery or um, the idea that women should have a right to vote, you know, would have sounded absurd in the past. Mm. Um, there are roles for... Um, for journalists, for writers to cover some of these issues. I mean, 5,000 children died today. Did that make the news? <laughs> um, no, because it happens every day. But uh, I think that should get much more coverage than it does. Mm. Um, and there are also just, um, this is again, something that everyone can do. We now have you know, access to social media. We can spread messages um, much further than we could before. Mm. And so being someone who is in a very sensible careful, responsible mm. way, you know, trying to promote people to reflect and think morally and reflect on some of their choices mm. um, can be a powerful piece of advocacy. Yeah. But do you, do you think that, the, I mean, talking about the abolitionist uh, movement, for instance, which, which is salient in the book, uh, do you think that, that, that the reason that that happened, that slavery ended, was because uh, a relatively small number of people wanted to, to end it? Or was it rather that the, it was something in the the c collective unconscious, if you will, mm -hmm. that had changed, that had happened, so that it would have happened anyway? So uh, because I, I tend to think that that was the case, but but you, I think you're arguing for the case that it actually was an active choice by a few people. So I think there's uh, three possible explanations. Yeah. So one I reject entirely. So one that people often think is. Um, this was just a result of economic forces that made slavery unprofitable. It just didn't make sense because of um, increased mechanization, um, automation. I think this has just been definitively refuted, essentially, yeah. by historical scholarship. Um, you know, the price of slaves was increasing. The profit profitability of slave plantations um, were, was increasing um, at the point of time of abolition. It was enormously expensive for um, the British Empire to... Um, abolish slave, slavery when it did. Um, so this, it really looks, and this is like the consensus. That's, that was an interesting piece of news, actually, it, yeah, that it yeah. cost the British government yeah. so much. 2% of British yeah. GDP for I 60 years, that. much more than we spend on foreign aid today yeah. in percentage terms. Uh, so, you know, that's really quite well accepted among historians, that it's kind of, it's a matter of cultural change rather than economic change, though obviously there's, in, there's mixings. The second question is harder, which is, how broad a cultural change. So certainly there was a m more general move towards democratization, liberalization, appeal of free markets. Um, was, was the abolition of slavery more or less inevitable given those changes? And there, I'm just, I don't know. I'm like, I mean, after all, um, enlightenment had happened before, not so long before that. Exactly, yeah. So it was certainly part of that general trend. Um, I'm not sure that makes the abolition of slavery inevitable, though, because there, are, you know, moral inconsistency mm. can persist for a very long time. Mm. Where you know we have these enlightened egalitarian views, yet we let thousands of children die who we could help every single day. Um, yet we have um, uh, often, you know, quite um, horrible attitudes to. Uh, people who've been imprisoned for nonviolent offenses or, you know, people of other, um, uh, from other countries and so on. Um, and so it doesn't, so yeah, I definitely think it, um, it helped for sure. Um, and maybe made it inevitable, but I'm not confident. Mm. Well, anyway, I guess it's always a good idea to push for, for good and, exactly, and, and, yeah. and high, and, high values. Yeah. And even if it was mm. part of this larger trend, well, mm. that larger trend was because of individuals, mm. ultimately. It was a large, large number of people um, making arguments. So you don't believe that, that history has, has, a, has a natural co co course? So I think it depends on what we're talking about. So, because, I mean, after all, we are here and we, we're better off yeah. than ever. And, and, and I mean, 
for the most part, peaceful uh, world. I mean, yep. still so I think going on, but I mean, compared to 300 years ago. Exactly, so. yeah. So I think we're in a lucky place in many yeah, ways. Yeah. Um, I think some aspects of history are more or less inevitable. So should I expect, you know, if we started history again, would I expect the size of the world population to increase over time? Yes, I yeah. think so. Mm. Should I expect technology to accumulate? Yes, I expect so. The kind of ordering of technologies we get are not kind of guaranteed, but like there's, you know, roughly kind of one step after the other. For moral changes, though, should I expect the abolition of slavery again if we were to re-roll history? I'm really not sure. So you think that, the, the, expect... that goes more up and down like this? or it's Yeah, it's less like a guaranteed arc mm -hmm. of progress, okay. I think. Yeah. But do you think that there are any values that are in inherently higher, if you will, than others? Or, or are there only values that are more fit for us to blossom? Mm. You see my point? Uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I do think that, uh, you know, some values are better than others that mm. are like things that are right and wrong in a kind of objective sense. Mm. I think it's very, you know, people, people often want to say like, no, it's all just a matter of opinion. And then I'm like, okay, so yeah, murdering that, a child... Yeah, that's a bit callous, isn't it? It mm. is a bit callous. And I say, okay, so murdering children for fun <laughs> and they're like, oh, it's just a matter of opinion. Mm. And people don't, mm. even if they say that in the philosophy seminar room, they then go and in practice mm. um, act in a way that is utterly it's inconsistent. inconsistent with that. That, yeah. Exactly. Or if you say like, okay, so, you know, the rise of Hitler was just neither a good thing nor a bad thing. And people mm. are like, no, it was very bad. So we have a sense of moral correctness. Um, we clearly think that um, things in many ways have gotten better, morally speaking. What I want is that trend to continue into the future and the ways in which things have gotten worse to, you know, to alter. So let's talk a little bit about uh, AI. I think you mentioned it yeah, yeah. Uh, before. It's it's so topical now. And it's so topical. So yeah. many things are happening. So, I mean, the basic question that everybody asks is, is it a, is it a threat or a blessing? blessing? I mean, it might be both or, or yeah. neither. <laughs> Who knows? But many seem to think that it is one of the extinction threats. But you don't. I, I think you were almost saying that before here. But I think in the yeah. book you're not you're not talking about AI as one of the concrete threats of extinction. Uh, so I do. Yeah, plenty to say. So firstly, I do think of AI as both a threat and a blessing. Like it has yeah. enormous potential upsides, enormous potential downsides. Yeah. And in the book, I do highlight it as um, uh, a risk of causing the extinction of humanity. Um, but the thing that I'm pressing more is it's not only that. <laughs> so I do think, so you know, this recent open letter which I signed was um, that a one-line letter which is extinction risk from AI uh, is, should be as, you know, mitigating that should be as great an important a priority as mitigating the risks from nuclear weapons and pandemics. And I entirely agree with that, but that's to only focus on the extinction risk is to miss um, what I think the larger picture is, which is that the move from present society to a society that where AI systems are as or even much more powerful than um, humans is an inflection point and potentially could have an impact over the very, very long run, whether or not the human race goes extinct. And uh, one way I spell out is that it could lead to intense concentration of power. So we could see the end of democracy, we could see a rise of authoritarian regimes, single rulers who have uh, control over the whole workforce because they're controlled by AIs, mm -hmm. control over um, you know, the military because the military is automated too. And so the thing I want to say is like extinction from AI is like absolutely a real risk and something we should take really seriously. But there's a whole much more, whole bunch more to worry about too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, potentially it could, uh, theoretically at least, it could, it could just as well uh, lead us to a better world because, because I mean, if we, they are machines after all. I mean, basically. Yes. So yeah, if yeah. we, if we instruct them to, to find solutions to oh, create a, a, a more loving world, yeah, they, they would work towards that, I guess. Exactly. So we could automate. I mean, AI could have huge benefits yeah. if we deal with the technology responsibly, if we are cautious, go slow, and invest in AI safety techniques. So all of the work, the boring, monotonous, drudge work that mm. most people do and get no very little value out of, that could all get automated away. We could have more time with our friends and family, could more time to engage in creative pursuits. Mm. We could have AI speeding up science so that um, we could figure out the kind of fundamental laws. We could have much better, much greater acceleration of... Um, 
biomedical technology, we could you know, cure most diseases. Really, the kind of scale of the upside is just yeah. almost as much as our imagination can take us. And uh, that, you know, that's an important thing to be bearing in mind when we're talking about AI, is how can we harness the benefits while mitigating the risks. Exactly. Yeah. So do you think that the, the, these machines, which they are uh, basically, uh, will be at our service even when, even after the point that they become smarter than us? And if so, is that then because they are, that because we are conscious and they are not, or is it for any other reason? Uh, I don't think the consciousness is going to be a relevant factor. I mean, I think we're going to have to count, encounter this unbelievably hard problem of figuring out whether these AI systems are conscious or not. And we just don't have the tools to know because we'll be able to train them. And so we can train them to say they're conscious. We can train them to say they're not conscious. So whether or not what they tell us is not um, going to help. But maybe we can feel that they're not conscious. Well, but we're going into esoteric. We're going into now. esoteric territory, but um, it's just going to be very hard to know. They'll have very sophisticated behavior, but it's running on a very different substrate, you know, silicone rather than, yeah. um, uh, rather than brains, and that is going to just make it very hard to know. And so that's a big that's a big philosophical issue that we need to confront. There is an enormous amount of work to make sure that AI systems are kind of aligned, and. Uh, I think there are kind of three possible scenarios, and I'm not very confident in any of them being the outcome we'll get. One is that AI systems are misaligned. Um, they have their own goals. They don't care about humanity. Could lead to extinction or just complete disempowerment in the way that, you know, we haven't made the ants extinct, but it's not like ants are really controlling what happens. True. Good um, example. <laughs> so that's one. Um, a second is... Um, that yeah, AI systems just exist entirely to kind of serve humanity. Um, that's what some people are kind of aiming for in particular. And then there's a third, which is that um, AI systems do end up more powerful than us. Um, you know, they have their own goals, but they are morally motivated. They care about humanity. They don't want to um, make us extinct. And that could be a good outcome too, even if it's not that they're exactly aligned with human goals. Nonetheless, um, uh, they are acting as kind of moral agents. And I don't know which of those we're going to end up with. Um, mm. And uh, we should just be tra really trying to make sure we don't end up in the scenario where uh, the AI systems are just going to entirely take, a, take out humanity or are pursuing um, uh, goals that are kind of highly immoral. Mm. Well, this is probably a, 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 a lousy analogy, but I mean, we, we have developed technology all, all along, of course, and there are some inventions that we have come up with that, I mean, at the time when they were invented, they were probably seen as uh, very dangerous, but we have been able to harness them or, mm. or, and to control them. I mean, the most obvious example, of course, is nuclear weapons. I mean, we, yep. we have them, they can, they can, I don't know if they're, if the totality I, of nuclear weapons uh, would be able to wipe out the whole of humanity, but it would be a big problem anyway, if, thumb, if yeah. they all went off. But we, we're still here and we haven't, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, through the through the grace of God, <laughs> partly. Yeah, um, yeah. And there then, have been there have been many like very near miss misses where they I know, been yeah, all out I know. War. I've heard about that, but um, uh, and there are other. I mean, more <laughs> perhaps uh, uh, down to earth examples like like uh, safety matches, for instance, which mm -hmm. are extremely dangerous because you can you can burn down a house and kill twenty people with one match, and yeah, you can yeah, you can yeah. you can start a wildfire, and they're sold in shops mm -hmm. freely. I don't. Th there's no age limit or anything. Yeah, you can yeah. just buy them and. I mean, before so, that, it was pretty difficult to 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 yeah 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 to it's create good, fire, it's you know. But point. Now yeah. you can you can just uh, create um, start arson. Yeah, yeah. Anytime, um, anywhere. I mean, also just, you know we drive cars. But people don't do that. Cars could kill dozens of people. Well, so, some do, but yeah, I mean, very some few do. do. But rarely. Yeah, I mean, um, it is a striking thing about the world how much of it, how much destruction could be re could be wreaked if people wanted to. Yeah. So I don't know. I sometimes get these intrusive thoughts, you know. Uh, where just your brain just con conjures up images and you're holding a knife and I'm like, I could just yeah. stab you right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Or like when you're on the cliff and you're like, I could just jump off this cliff, know, but people, yeah. don't. people don't. And that's a source of concern because AI systems that we build, maybe they don't have, you know, we have these human safeguards where thankfully humanity just doesn't want to kill other people. Like not very often. For the most part, yeah. Sometimes it happens and <laughs> we've had, you know, many genocides and devastation as a result, but mm. on average people don't. An AI system doesn't necessarily have the same models. Mm. Like, you know, 
it could be a psychopath a thousand times over, mm. just um, mm. entirely unguarded um, by kind of yeah normal human constraints. Well, let's hope that it makes doesn't it go that worrying. far. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit a bit worrying actually. Uh, now, who are I mean, we you talk about. We, I guess, humanity. You have that's something you have to do when you write a book like this about the whole mm. hum, yeah. whole of humanity. So, who are we? What is we? Is it mm. even reasonable to consider the whole of humanity as as um, as one group that can yeah. collectively follow one path? I mean, yeah. we are eight billion different perspectives of reality. I mean, many perspectives are very similar, of course, because yeah, we, yeah. We, are, we live in families and groups and nations and all that. that but we're, I mean, 8 billion. I, yeah, I'm not yeah. talking about nations here because nations yeah, are yeah, yeah. just temporary uh, constructs. But, but there are so many different humans. But is it possible to talk about a we in this context? Yeah, I do think it's a... Yeah, I do think the we is a kind of complex and slippery thing. And there are mistakes that one can make if you think about we as humanity and you know sometimes even colleagues of mine talk about like oh, we all kind of have the same values and we kind of want the same things mm. i'm like i don't really see mm. that i think um people can have very different values um very different ideologies and some of them are better and some of them are worse in terms of what will build a flourishing society um some are more egalitarian some are more authoritarian for example um so i think that's an important phenomenon um uh and so ultimately, when I think about the kind of we of humanity, I am just referring to kind of the collection of 8 billion people. Um, I don't really think there's this extra kind of organism or entity that is humanity as a whole. Um, and when I at least personally talk about the future of humanity and we as humanity, I'm just using that as a shortcut for mm. the kind of aggregate of 8 billion people's interests. Because yeah. it's, it's people, individual people ultimately that are of moral importance. Mm. Yeah, because I'm I'm referring to the mean I mean the the solutions the problems that we have and the solutions that we yeah. need to use to to solve those problems. Uh, maybe maybe there there will be um, uh, hundreds of different solutions to 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 one problem. Yeah, and uh, I mean like 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 the markets. Uh, let's see what solution works best. Uh, yeah, absolutely, exactly. I mean, for instance, yeah, there are cases where. Yeah, I mean, often often in fact, you know, you want highly democratized. You know, people innovate and mm. innovation can come from anywhere. And so you want to have as many attempts um, uh, for people to innovate as possible. Yeah. And in fact, part of the one leading explanation for why the industrial and scientific revolutions and enlightenment happened where they did in Eastern and Western Europe was because there was this rise of Protestantism in particular, made this more intellectually egalitarian culture. Uh, more people, many more people were literate, mm. so there were just many more people who could have, like, um, you know, innovations essentially. Um, uh, yes, and I've yeah. heard that that's also a difference between Europe and, and one reason why Europe uh, flourished eventually and not China was that mm. China was more centralized. Yes, yeah, yeah. So they didn't have this competition between ideas yeah, in the, the same yeah, way. Exactly, yeah. As Europe had. Whereas, yeah, Europe was. In incredibly disparate in terms of different city states and so yeah. on and you get like kind of competition between them right right yeah so hasn't humankind always faced the possibility of either prosperity or doom mm. i mean depending on the choices we make so uh, that's that's a, just a rhetorical question uh, so what is it that makes this juncture in history so particular so crucial mm. as you point out in the book yeah i think the stakes are just much higher as in the level of doom that we could face or the level of prosperity we could face uh, is much greater now. So his, for most of human history, there was no way that a single individual could kill a large fraction of the world population. Genghis Khan? I mean, Genghis Khan... Uh, comes close? Comes close. He managed to kill 10% of the world's population. That is the worst. Um, that and the, Genghis Khan and the Black Death are the two largest catastrophes in history by a fraction of the world. Um, uh, killed, yeah. yeah, who were killed. Um, so it's a good counter example. But I think now we can kill, like individuals could kill even larger faction, namely those um, decision makers in charge of nuclear weapons. Mm. And so that's been through since, you know, the 1950s. That is a new level of power, of destructive power that we have. Um, when we develop advanced bioweapons, um, and I use, sadly use the term when rather than if, potentially that can be more than just tens of percent of the world population, but 90%, mm. 99%, maybe even, you know, maybe even more. And so there's an increase in power within um, 
uh, yeah, individual decision makers for the kind of destructiveness they can reap. The prosperity also increases though as well. I mean, we're richer than we've ever been in the past and that could increase again dramatically. Mm. And so I'm not saying that maybe there's an even more important time, an even scarier time in a hundred years. Mm. Um, I don't know, but uh, um, certainly now compared to before, just we're getting increasingly powerful and it's not at all clear that we have the, the wisdom to handle that power. Yeah. Well, I myself, I tend to point to the fact that we are integrated or integrating mm. globally for the first time in at least yeah. in recorded history. And yeah, that, that is very crucial. It is. Absolutely. So would you agree on that? Uh, that? Yeah. Again, this is something I talk about yeah. um, as a way in which our moment is unusual. So, you know, for a large part of human history, we were literally out of contact, yeah. you know, di across different continents. Yeah. Colonial era, for better or worse, kind of unified that. Now with uh, communication technology, we can speak to anyone in the world exactly. instantly. Mm. Um, and actually I talk, it's kind and of... That, that a, does something to us, I think. Yeah, yeah well, it also us. it means that ideas can take over the whole world at once. Um, that could never happen before. So um, you have some brilliant new idea or some ideology, it's a toxic ideology. In principle, you could, in, you could tell that to every single person. Um, uh, in the world, or pretty much 90% of people in the world. And actually, um, kind of, this is also going to be only for a period of time where um, in the very long run, if we start spreading to other solar systems and so on, oh. communication will start taking longer and longer. So if you were on the other side of the galaxy, it'd take me 100,000 years <laughs> to send you a message, 100,000 years to come no. back. And actually, once you go no. far enough, no. um, then communication becomes impossible altogether. And we would again split into, it's like a cute thought, but um, we would again split into um, physically isolated mm. um, uh, kind of civilizations yeah. that couldn't possibly talk to each other. Provided we survived that, that long. Provided we, which is, you know, maybe yeah. a long shot, but um, if yeah, we Yeah, but I love those, those huge perspectives, yeah. uh, like, you, like you use in the book, uh, going galactic. Yeah, why not? I mean, and then as you say, it would be split up again, and then yeah, yeah. maybe we can once again, uh, integrate on that level. Uh, so talking about that, which this is a, an excellent segue over to my next question, because, um, or I, I, I'll make it my next question. What would a close encounter of the fifth kind with extraterrestrials <laughs> mean for uh, enti entail for our evolution? And this is not a woo-woo question anymore, yeah, if yeah. it ever was, because as you know, there have been a lot of disclosures yeah, about, yeah, in the yeah, Pentagon so. about seeing uh, unidentified aerial phenomena and also i mean the latest thing here was that that the, the, the pentagon has retrieved craft i mean we don't know if that's, that's true but claims, it was yeah. a pretty high level source so, for that. so yeah. david grush so i mean who knows yeah what, so what does that entail yeah what so with respect to the unidentified aerial objects which are now the uh, preferred term or phenomena or phenomena yes yeah. yeah, sorry you're right uh certainly there's something weird going on there and i don't have a good sense of like what it is um, I'd be extremely surprised if it was aliens for the following reason, where if aliens are visiting, <laughs> their technology will be so far beyond ours <laughs> that it would be extremely surprising if they are like going around and able to be seen just a little bit. Mm. Like and they could either be... And crashing. And crashing. Yeah, yeah very, very odd. Mm. Um, where if they wanted to not be seen at all, then they could <laughs> just monitor everything we're doing without mm. being detected. Mm. If they wanted to say hi, then mm. they could just actually say hi. And yeah, the idea that they would then fly all this way and then suddenly not be able to like um, steer an aircraft and crash, I think is just extremely unlikely. So bad weather on the exactly, planet Earth. Yeah. So, uh. <laughs> but then um, if there were contact with um, alien civilizations, I used to think that the form that would take is that uh, we would see them Five minutes later, we would all be immediately evaporated because it was uh, the aliens would just use all of our resources to um, uh, whatever their ends were. You know, they would have some goal, and uh, the Earth could just be like deconstructed into solar panels that could be used to power the computers. Well, would that be do... that goal be malevolent? Well, necessarily. I mean, it could. They could be doing nice things with it, but um, my thought was that they would be kind of indifferent um, to us. But. Uh, now I actually think that's a little different where, um, think differently about it, where if you've got some future, yeah, some alien civilization, 
if they care, if they're in, like, if they're interested even just the tiniest bit <laughs> um, in seeing what uh, you know human humanity is up to, like mm-hmm. even just as an experiment, mm-hmm. even of scientific interest, then uh, the gains that they get from you know wiping it all out would be very very small. Um, so perhaps it's the case that they come and then like study us and so on. Well, like we study um, the ants, or like we study the ants exactly. So we can, cer- you know, we, uh, you know, early Homo sapiens killed off enormous fractions of um, large animals, um, but now we're like, you know, we're kind of culturally evolved a bit, and we actually try and preserve, like, prevent yeah. extinction yeah. because partly because some people like the pandas, but also because they're scientifically interesting, we get like options. Um, so I would be more inclined to think that they might just come and watch, yeah. actually. And if they're there, they're probably watching us, I mean, already. And that could well be the, yeah, yeah I mean. I, I agree that this, this crashing well craft be. thing is a bit is a bit far-fetched, actually, or a little bit it is, l- it ludicrous. Is, but it seems very surprising to me. But but, um, but I mean, they if they're here, they're, if there are aliens and they are watching us, they are probably able to, I mean, not see to it that they're not seen for, for, mm, by us that's yeah and if they want us to see them they can they can see to it that we do and yeah. and if they decide to do that so that we realize that we're not alone in the universe that that might ha- do something with us i mean yeah i mean morally and psychologically some, yeah, exactly what what could that uh well yeah entail? so um uh it is interesting like are the aliens where i mean depending on like, if they're malevolent or benevolent of yeah, course yeah, but of course. i mean Provided um, they're they're benevolent and they they, they contact us in, in some way and, and yeah. tell us that we, we just want to teach you things and we we hope that you will have a good great future we can, we can help you if you want if you want our yeah, help yeah. or something like that uh, yeah I mean it's it is interesting the question of aliens where it's like if aliens exist or if aliens don't exist both are just extraordinarily claims <laughs> yeah hugely I know yeah, important. I know <laughs> um, uh, I mean if if there is no other life advanced life that does give particular importance to ensuring that humanity continues. Because then perhaps there's just this particular extra value in having intelligence that's able to reason about the world, that's able to understand the world. Um, uh, whereas if there are is other kind of alien civilizations, well, okay, at least that, <laughs> that aspect of value is being yeah. covered. Yeah. Um, however, I th- yeah, and I think probably, so the reason I actually don't think that they're kind of Aliens out, you know, with Jupiter kind of watching us from a distance, um, or from another dimension. I mean, this is woo-woo, but yeah, yeah. I mean, they're like that. We don't know anything. More kind of speculative, um, but ultimately, I don't. Th- I think that's quite unlikely. And the reason mm-hmm. is, we see almost no evidence of um, any sort of kind of engineering of other solar systems um, in the galaxy. So we see no evidence of kind of intelligent life or intelligent action. Mm. Um, Even though there's been kind of 14, 13 and a half billion years since the Big Bang, and the rate of time from evolution of intelligent life to creation of a, you know, civilization that starts like leaving a real mark on the galaxy, you know, maybe that's millions of years, but it's not tens of billions of years. So if, you know, advanced life had evolved, we should expect to see some indication of it. Mm. We don't, that suggests that maybe it's just extremely rare indeed. Yeah. And so perhaps any alien life is billions of, uh, you know, billions of light years away, maybe even further. Again. Mm. Speaking of uh, civilization, the, the, the evolution of civilization, uh, I mean, you, you, you just um, assume in the book and, and generally, that, like most people do, that the story about human civilization is, is correct, that we're taught in school and all that. I mean... That civilization started very, 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 very recently, extremely recently, mm. actually, and that leads you to think that we are probably just at the beginning of a, of a mm. very, very long evolution here. But what if civilization actually began much earlier than 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 we are told? Because yeah. I mean, there are some indications of that. Yeah. Also, you mentioning these uh, the megafauna that that yeah, got extinct, yeah. and I personally, I don't think that hunter gatherers actually killed those to extinction. I think mm-hmm. there was a, I mean, and I'm not the only one saying this, there are a lot of uh, researchers now thinking that uh, there was a big cataclysm of some kind or, or, mm. or, or, or a series of them like 12 to 13,000 years ago. And that's that was the main culprit mm. behind this. So that's what happened. And before that, there could even have been 
high human civilizations. And what would that mean for your, I mean, your thinking around these things if, if, we, if we find that? And um, uh, I mean, maybe we can then learn things from past experiences and what happened mm -hmm. to them and, and maybe even from all these ancient texts that talk about this ancient apocalypse yeah. or ancient catastrophe that, that abound. I mean, almost every yeah. culture, all the uh, ancient culture has, has this story yeah. about okay, the catastrophe so, that happened. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, so on the kind of hunter-gatherers and the megafauna yeah. um, question, this was actually something we did a really deep dive into. It's huh. remarkably like uh, angry and uh, uh, polarized area of um, yeah, science. Yeah, um, Jewish still out, I, I think. think well, I actually think if you do a good analysis yeah. of the evidence, um, humans being the kind of decisive um, factor in the vast majority of cases, mm. the arguments seem very strong, actually. And that's not necessarily solely through um, hunting of the animals themselves. Maybe it could a be a combination of... Well, so climate change, climatic factors, mm. um, yeah, plausibly like were an aggravating factor mm. in many instances. But it could also just be like resource use, you start disrupting um, ecosystems. Or, you know, you kill the uh, moa so that Hass eagles, which um, normally eat the moa, they go extinct too. So you can have yeah. cascading effects too. But in general, the issue is just that we had these large megafauna extinctions. Megafauna, which went extinct at a much higher rate than smaller animals, mm. that happened shortly after human arrival, but many times in different mm. places. So it would be like this coincidence, I think, mm. if it's... Um, I, I read uh, studies that, that uh, refute that, actually. For instance, in Australia, that, I mean, people yeah. arrived, humans arrived in Australia much earlier than, than earlier thought. Oh, oh, yeah, but then the question is... And then is, the, the, the extinction event was like 12, 13,000 years ago, but people arrived 50,000 years ago. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it depends on... Um, obviously, there's a kind of a critical size mm. that um, people have to... You know, the first... We don't ten, have to... first 10 people aren't going to make everyone yeah. extinct. Yeah. But once a population gets to a, like, the larger and larger the population gets... Um, the more kind of animals are going to um, be rendered extinct mm. by as a result of the kind of larger population. Um, so, and really, it's also just like not at all surprising. Like humans are this like radically new sort of species, essentially, and we're essentially like an invasive species going into these um, other continents. Uh, other animals have just not co-evolved with us, and so don't understand, like, aren't able to have mm. like the same defense mechanisms that they should. So it's like not very surprising. Um, on the idea of like civilization starting earlier, like I do think, um, you know, when you look at the kind of anthropological evidence and they say, oh, this sort of activity started then, they're normally saying like, this is when we have evidence for a certain activity. And I do think that like over time, we're going to start more and more advanced human behaviors. We're going to like push further into the past. Mm. So even just five well, you years You have Gubekli Tepe in Turkey, for instance, which mm -hmm. is now proven to be, I think, 11,000 years old or 12. Okay, yeah, for example. And that's an advanced megalithic structure. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. And it's because we've got very little evidence in the past. Mm. So um, uh, it means that, you know, we're having to kind of guess. And even the evolution of Homo sapiens, like, yeah. even just it's also five, pushed back five, uh, ten, five uh, years ago was 200,000 years ago. I know. And, and when I went to school, it was 70,000 years. Okay, yeah, exactly. So, so that will keep going back. It, yeah, it keeps going back. Um, but then on the terms of there being a bottleneck, um, there was the argument that there was the toe bear eruption. And that reduced human population to a very small size. Um, but genetic evidence suggests that there hasn't been an intense bottleneck. Um, so there definitely have been civilizational collapses in the past. Mm. But um, it looks like not a civilizational collapse such that mm. there were only ever like, you know, a few thousand or mm. tens of thousands of humans. Well, um, I have so many more questions to ask, but I, I think we're running out of time here. Yeah. But you just uh, this is a big one, but maybe you can just answer briefly. You don't consider that humankind's next big leap could be... An inward leap? Um, I mean, possibly. There's so many options, so many um, possibilities in the future. Mm. I mean, this is one resolution of why don't we see any aliens? Maybe just once you get sufficiently advanced enough, you realize that... Mm. Um, I mean, raising consciousness in some way and uh, becoming yeah, more, more advanced. Uh, yeah, exactly. In, Maybe in you realize way. the best thing to do is not to spread out and become ever bigger, but instead um, exactly. have a life of spirituality. You don't I go mean, into that in the book, but... I don't. It's, I mean, I do think um, it's an option, but... The thing is, it would have to be everyone agrees on doing that. If there's only one group that's like, no, I want to get bigger. But maybe it, ha it just expands. happens. Oh. But maybe it, maybe it just happens. Esoteric. But, um, yeah. 
Okay. okay. William, fantastic. Well, thank uh, you so much for where, having me on. Yeah, it's, it's been great. Where, where can people find you if they want to know more? You have a website, right? Yeah, so I have a website, uh, my own personal website, williammccaskill.com, and the What We Are The Future website, whatweowethefuture.com. Oh. Um, if you're inspired by these ideas and you want to take action, Given what we can is the place to go for um, your donations. 80,000 hours is the place to go for career yeah. choice. And I put links in the description box, of course. Great, of course. For this. William, thank cool. you so thank much. You so much. Good luck with your laudable endeavor to improve the world. Thank you. Thank you.